So today we are excited to host some experts who will uh, be able to help you and your organization navigate the, this quickly evolving landscape as more and more people continue to get vaccinated. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Tiffany Tauschek and I'm the COO at the Greater Des Moines Partnership. And as you know, we have seen some really significant positive news in recent weeks regarding the vaccine rollout, uh, both at the national level and the state and local level. We're getting closer and closer to the time when things may start to feel just a little bit more normal, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. But we also know and understand that it will be a new normal. So joining us today, we have economist Alex Doherty with uh, Chamara economics and analytics, who will discuss what herd immunity will mean for our community, as well as give a quick economic overview. So very happy to have you, Alex. Thanks for joining us. We also have Kendra Simmons from Fredrickson and Byron, who will present on HR rules related to returning to in-office, uh, in-person office operations. This is a question uh, we are getting from numerous businesses on a daily basis right now. So really pleased to have you. And also we have Stephen Smith with Work and People Analytics, who will be presenting also on return to work strategies for organizations. So really helpful, valuable information that we're going to hear today and learn from these experts. Before we turn it over to our presenter, Centers. Just a quick reminder that tomorrow we have our partnership investor and member virtual briefing. Oh, those are every two weeks on Wednesdays at noon. And we are excited to have Governor Kim Reynolds join us tomorrow to speak with us and provide some updates. We're also going to hear a healthcare update from Unity Point Health President uh, and CEO David Stark. So please plan to join us tomorrow at noon for the partnership investor and member briefing. We have a lot of other great news to share with you tomorrow as well. Now today, we will get started with our first presenter, Alex Doherty, the economist, an economist with Chamara Economics and Analytics. Please feel free to leave any questions that you have uh, for Alex in the chat, and we'll facilitate those questions as time allows. But with that, I will again pass it over to Alex. Alex, so happy to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tiffany. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Excellent, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for having me uh, today. As Tiffany said, I'm Alex Doherty. I'm an economist. Uh, I've been with uh, Tremora Economics and Analytics uh, for almost seven years now. I work on a variety of projects um, from our economic impact work um, to anything involving uh, labor market information and survey work. Um, and I also work with our blue chip economists, uh, Dr. Chris Tremora, um, and Dr. Xiaobing Shui on our forecasts, um, both at a national level uh, and for specific regions throughout the country. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? I'm um, going to give a, a quick uh, economic overview for the nation um, and then kind of focus on herd immunity and uh, answer a question that might be in your mind of why economists might be diving into uh, medical data. Um, and uh, providing a forecast for herd immunity. W what are we doing there? Um, so we'll get to that. But uh, uh, first, we'll do a, a quick background on uh, who Tamura is, if anybody is unfamiliar. Uh, so we provide labor market data uh, and analysis that allows our clients to make uh, strong, informed decisions to help their own communities really thrive. We were founded in 1998 by uh, Dr. Chris Tamura. We have offices in Richmond, Virginia, that's where I am, as well as Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and we are soon to be opening up an office in Texas. Uh, so we are a group of economists, data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals um, who really help uh, communities grow all across the country, uh, driven by, uh, sorry, my computer froze a second. There we go. Um, driven by client satisfaction and success, and excellence is our priority um, in customer service and data quality. So what are we gonna discuss today? Uh, we're gonna give a, a quick national overview, um, talking about uh, how the re recession first started in February, 2020, um, and how it's been a uh, very uh, a startling, a deep recession, um, but it's been a, a short, uh, short recession, and we're seeing a, a quick recovery. And then we'll get into kind of what employment rebounds at a national level might look like, 
and then we'll really get into uh, herd immunity and why that's needed um, for a full recovery and what a forecast for human, uh, herd immunity looks like. So for the national economy, um, pre-COVID, the economy was very fundamentally sound. Um, employment was growing and income and consumption were steadily increasing. So while two consecutive quarters of declining GDP is typically used to define uh, a recession for the, um, for the U.S., but given the proverbial, uh, sorry, the National Bureau of Economic Research, or NBER, um, is the official agency that defines a recession in the U.S., um, but given the kind of proverbial cliff that we fell off uh, last February or really last uh, March and April, um, they didn't really wait to see two quarters of uh, GDP decline. Um, in June 2020, they uh, declared that a recession actually had begun um, as of February 2020. So what does that actually look like? Um, we see kind of over on the left what the Great Recession looked like uh, from a GDP perspective, the decline, and that that's really dwarfed by the, uh, the major drop in GDP we saw in the first quarter in 2020. But then we saw it immediately really strongly rebound um, in the second quarter. So this is really highlighting um, the, the forecast that most people are confident about, that it was a very sharp and short recession in terms of gross domestic product. Um, and that it's not sustained. And we've seen a, a continued kind of steady growth um, in that three to 5% range since uh, the second quarter last. So that's what it looks like in terms of GDP, but we've seen employment is a bit more lagging in terms of recovery, um, not really surprising. So the employment recovery and overall economic recovery is very dependent on uh, the vaccine production, as well as administering the vaccine and reaching herd immunity. So we've built three different scenarios describing kind of what, uh, what the recovery might look like. The likely scenario shown here in the orange line um, expects the vaccine to be widely distributed um, in, the, uh, in the second quarter with no further shutdown, no, no real bumps in the road. In this scenario, we expect uh, national employment to reach pre-COVID levels in the first quarter of 2022. We see the two other scenarios, the, the slower scenario there in the, the blue or teal green line. Um, it takes a little bit longer. Um, maybe we have some, uh, some more bumps um, that we're not able to, uh, to sustain this strong uh, vaccine administration. Um, but uh, that's luckily looking less and less likely, but we'll get deeper into that. Um, if we do hit some bumps, uh, it might take until the third quarter of, um, or the second quarter of 2022 for us to reach pre-COVID employment levels. Um, in the FAST scenario, we're actually expecting um, to reach pre-COVID employment levels this year in the fourth quarter. So what does that recovery in employment really look like by industry? Uh, at the top here, we've seen um, like the agriculture and forestry uh, major industry um, really took a, a very slight dip um, and then actually recovered very quickly and is already at pre-COVID levels. Um, and this actually includes actual data through the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, so kind of right through here, we see um, actual data. At the bottom in red, we really see how the arts and entertainment and recreation industry was hit the hardest. Um, and then that was uh, followed closely behind by accommodation and food services, uh, losing a significant portion of their employment. But once again, we've already kind of seen that, that rebound start and we're uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing that uh, continue. Now, the, this next slide, we're going to take off those bottom two hardest hit industries and kind of look look at what's, uh, what's next hardest hit. So after we look at, uh, after the arts and entertainment industry and the accommodation and food services industry, we see the, that the uh, next, harvest, next hardest hit industries are a uh, variety of other services, as well as the mining quarrying um, and oil and gas extraction industries. The oil and gas uh, industry really hit hard by the uh, kind of the complete lack of travel. 
um, that that's a, a major supplier um, there. Next, we see man, uh, retail trade was also very, very hard hit. Um, that's uh, we've seen a, a bit of a uh, many retailers were actually hit harder than that uh, that red line might actually show um, because some of this is buoyed by uh, online um, online shopping really helping um, several retailers keep up. But for retailers that uh, don't can't or don't offer uh, online shopping, then uh, their employment suffered uh, even stronger than this may show. Uh, and then here we see manufacturing and construction um, also taking a, a harder hit and taking a look at what their recovery might look like over the next several years. So in order to kind of get that recovery, uh, we really need to, uh, to continue our, uh, our strong steps in vaccine administration and really reach a level of herd immunity. So we can talk about um, now we'll talk about kind of the status quo and what Chimura's forecast for herd immunity looks like. So where are we now? Well, we see in the bottom right here, we're looking at the number of confirmed daily uh, COVID infections across the U.S. So while the U.S. is over uh, 540,000 deaths attributable to COVID, uh, the good news is that we've seen a huge drop in COVID cases and hospitalizations over the past couple months. Medical experts have attributed this decrease to a variety of factors, um, including one, a return to baseline travel rates after the winter holidays, um, two, improved usage of face coverings and social distancing, uh, three, less COVID tests actually being taken, and four, the very beginnings of herd immunity um, via, via those who have both already been infected and those who have uh, received their, the vaccine. So while this trend is very positive and we hope it continues, um, we see the dotted line that the daily infection rate is still at a higher level than it was throughout uh, most of fall 2020. So will this trend of decreasing cases continue? Uh, that, that's a bit of a, a question. It looks like it's flat now, but that is a, a major question that I'm sure many of you have seen across the news lately. So we aren't medical experts here, so we're using the University of Washington's Institute for Health uh, Metric Institute for Health Metrics forecasted estimated infections. And these are estimated infections, so they're a little higher. Um, they're actually significantly higher than the number of confirmed infections through testing. Here we see their most likely projection purple uh, with additional scenarios in red and green. They regularly update these models uh, with projections up to three months into the future. These are important in our herd immunity model because uh, we know that individuals infected with COVID retain some level of herd immunity. Uh, these projections are included in our forecast. This is a major input into our forecast. So now this is an assumption that we need to pay close attention to, as I just alluded to, as uh, the University of Washington is forecasting rates to continue decreasing. There are some experts who disagree, citing the recent spike in U.S. air travel, as well as the number of cases in Europe, as a bit of a warning sign, since the U.S. has generally lagged behind Europe um, in terms of infections by a couple weeks. The recent spike uh, in travel in the U.S. is a concern, uh, since more people have been flying per day over the past week um, than did so over the winter holidays on a uh, per day on an average per day basis. That said, the vaccine rollout and administration has been more efficient and widespread in the U.S. compared to most of Europe. So there's really good reason for optimism that we might not see a spike like Europe, and that looks like uh, the direction that the University of Washington is projecting their data. So what does herd immunity actually mean? Uh, there are various studies detailing um, what herd immunity via infection or vaccine actually does in terms of how likely you are to be infected again and how likely you would be to transmit COVID to another person, even if you yourself are immune. But the common understanding is that if you're immune uh, via previous infection or via vaccination, vaccination, 
you're extremely unlikely to develop serious illness that would require hospitalization. So that's great news. And for all intents and purposes, that means that the U.S. will likely see a return to normal as this level of herd immunity is reached. Some rosy predictions have come out recently saying that we're on track to reach herd immunity as early as April. Now, while all COVID forecasts, including our own, must be taken with an abundance of caution and grain of salt, this kind of feels unattainable. So to reach herd immunity as early as April, uh, we'd require several things, um, an overnight ramp up to over 4 million uh, vaccine doses being administered per day, as well as current infections continuing to decrease uh, at a pretty fast rate. And uh, nearly all infected individuals would need to retain uh, near 95% plus immunity um, from as early as March 2020, uh, which we don't have the data on uh, quite yet. So this is showing um, that in our uh, optimistic and kind of most likely forecasts, we're projecting herd immunity for the nation uh, in late summer, in August, in the optimistic scenario, and September in the most likely scenario. And you'll see, you can see kind of how the optimistic and most likely scenario lines, the green and gold lines there, are really trending very close together. Um, that's a good thing. It's because the vaccination efforts have been so successful that we've really seen um, the most likely, the trend really approach um, kind of what, what we believe might be the maximum uh, level of vaccine administration could be for the country. Um, but we'll get into all of that now. So we're economists. So whenever we build models, we have to have certain assumptions in them. Um, so here we have uh, several that go into this model uh, that I'll, uh, I'll go over now. So these are the uh, other assumptions. Uh, the current vaccine contracts uh, are for Moderna and Pfizer to each provide 300 million doses, um, 300 million each from Moderna and then another 300 million from Pfizer. These are the two dose vaccines. So that's enough in total to vaccinate, vaccinate 300 million Americans. There are also two uh, separate contracts with Johnson & Johnson to provide a total of 200 million doses of their vaccine, which is enough to vaccinate 200 million Americans as this is a single dose vaccine. So combined total, we have enough to vaccinate 500 million Americans, uh, which is more than enough uh, under contract since the US population is about 328 million. While the Pfizer and Moderna manufacturing process has generally been smoothly accelerating, uh, production for the J&J, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, has seen some more delays. While this vaccine only requires a single dose, their ability to meet their contract timeline, which uh, is 100 million doses delivered by the end of June, um, that's their initial uh, contract, uh, their ability to meet that is going to have a strong impact on our vaccination efforts and in turn our progress towards herd, imu herd immunity. So that's something that we're going to have to watch very closely. Now, as of yesterday, over 82 million Americans have received a single dose of vaccine, including 45 million who are fully vaccinated per CDC. This is fantastic. This is if we're uh, get, get really into the, the stats on this, I'd say this is hitting the, uh, the, the 95th uh, level of confidence, 95th confidence interval uh, for this, which I think was a, um, uh, a tweet by Nate Silver, if anyone follows uh, 538. Um, that 82 million, that's one in four Americans. So 25% of Americans have received at least one dose of the vaccine. On average, over the past week, uh, the U.S. has been administering about 2.5 million doses per day. Uh, when we were just getting started with uh, vaccine development and kind of looking at that timeline, uh, and there were interviews with experts all over the place, the rosiest predictions said that the U.S. would be able to administer at most 3 million uh, doses per day. So this ramp up is phenomenal. Uh, this is it, hard to be doing a, a whole lot better than this. Um, that said, we still could. We could very much exceed these rosiest predictions. 
Um, Moderna and Pfizer recently announced that they're soon going to double the amount of vaccines distributed um, per week. So the current bottleneck in vaccine administration is the supply of vaccines. But if Moderna and Pfizer are successful in doubling their vaccine production and distribution, uh, the bottleneck could switch to logistics, meaning can states and localities actually administer vaccines as fast as they receive the doses. And that's just a fantastic problem to have, um, being able to possibly exceed three, 3 million doses per day uh, would be phenomenal. Um, so looking at uh, some other broad assumptions for our forecast is that uh, in forecasting out state level uh, vaccine administration figures, we're assuming uh, that their historical ability to vaccinate is a predictor of their uh, ability to continue administering vaccine in, at a few, uh, in the future at a rate that eventually returns um, to a national average um, in about a, a year to a year and a half from now. We're also assuming that the future introduction of additional vaccines, including the AstraZeneca uh, and Novavax vaccines that I believe are the closest uh, to receiving FDA authorization, um, that these do not significantly alter the, US, the U.S.'s vaccine rollout. Um, we are keeping an eye on the AstraZeneca vaccine since uh, it looks like they might be getting close there. It looks like there's some mixed messages um, in the news about uh, the effectiveness um, of that, but we are keeping an eye on that. We're also assuming that 80% um, is the threshold for herd immunity. So either uh, via vaccine or via uh, having retaining antibodies uh, via a previous COVID infection, 80% um, of the country would need, need to be uh, immune to reach herd immunity. Uh, the recent studies, I believe, have come out, have shown that the majority of infected individuals retain uh, antibodies that likely provide immunity to COVID for at least six months. And uh, that number doesn't drop off a whole lot at the eight-month time frame. Um, so we're looking forward to hopefully that number continues to, uh, uh, to stay relatively high um, and that we retain immunity for more than six months, more than eight months. Um, so that, that's another uh, uh, strong trait, um, uh, silver lining of this that, that's helping um, us reach herd immunity faster. We're also assuming that 80% uh, or higher um, of the U.S. population uh, are or become willing uh, to receive the vaccine. Uh, this has trended upwards in recent months. In February, it was at 77% from a Kaiser Family Foundation um, poll and study. Uh, and we're also assuming that vaccines maintain uh, high, levels, high levels of efficacy against new and existing uh, strains or variants. Um, so this is another thing that we're watching closely. The faster we vaccinate, the less of a chance the uh, virus has a chance uh, the virus can mutate and develop existing variants. So if we vaccinate faster, the less of a concern uh, mutations are uh, since they need new hosts uh, to mutate. The current vaccines are uh, have shown a, a strong level of efficacy against the strains that are out there. Um, I believe the, the B117 strain that's going throughout Europe um, is concerning, but the vaccines are still uh, providing a strong enough protection against that strain. So what, what does this herd immunity look like at a state level? Uh, so here we have a, a map of the country, and we look at the states in green are going to be the furthest along towards herd immunity, and these are the states that we believe are going to reach herd immunity the fastest and the earliest. So we see Alaska, New Mexico, and West Virginia, um, as well as the Dakotas, really leading uh, the U.S. Um, on a positive note, we see Iowa uh, also in green. Uh, Iowa is ranked 17th in first doses administered, uh, meaning 26.8% of Iowans um, have received at least the first dose of the vaccine compared to 25% for the nation. Um, and Iowa ranks eighth in full vaccinations, uh, meaning that 16.3% of Iowans uh, have received are fully vaccinated 
compared to 13.6% for the US. And these numbers are as of yesterday morning. So in the optimistic scenario, um, we're projecting the states in green here, Alaska, New Mexico, and South Dakota, uh, to reach herd immunity in July uh, of this year, and that'll probably be towards the end of July. Uh, in light green, we see a uh, 31 states expected to reach herd immunity in August, and that includes uh, Iowa, so that's great news. Um, and then uh, we see 16 more uh, reaching herd immunity in September, uh, shown in the light blue here. We have Utah and actually uh, the District of Columbia are uh, the greatest uh, lags in terms of reaching herd immunity there. In the most likely forecast, it's very similar. We see uh, 22 states reaching herd immunity in August of this year uh, and 24 in September under this scenario. Um, once again, we see Iowa reaching herd immunity in August in this scenario. So uh, early August um, in the optimistic and kind of later August in the most likely scenario for Iowa. So overall, don't worry, the crisis will end. Um, Sharp and short, hopefully will uh, apply not only to GDP, but uh, when we look back several years from now, also to, uh, uh, to reaching herd immunity, that all things considered, this was a, uh, a very, uh, about as quick of a recovery as we could have um, possibly expected. Um, we're hoping that continues and that we reach herd immunity uh, in late summer um, this year. That would be fantastic. Um, national recession still expected sharp and short, not sustained for GDP. Employment is going to depend on uh, reaching herd immunity, but optimistic that we uh, will see an employment rebound either by the end of this year or early, hopefully early next year. Um, and with that being said, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Alex. Just fascinating information and uh, thank you for, for updating everything just even uh, from yesterday. So very, very relevant <laughs> um, information. Thank you. It, we do have time for a question or two. If you have a question, feel free to drop it in, in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting for those questions, just want to say again, thanks, Alex, for taking time to join us and also a big shout out to uh, Partnership research manager Marlena Bendersky, who uh, set this up and was key in connecting us to, to Alex. So Marlena, thank you so much for, for your leadership and connecting us to this great resource. Um, one question, Alex, um, you touched on this, but I want to make sure that, that I have clarity on it. So the modeling regarding um, herd immunity and timing, it does include the COVID variants that we are seeing and hearing about in the news today. Correct. It does. The current uh, vaccines are effective enough against the current variants um, to continue providing us with, uh, with that level of herd immunity. Um, it, as more data comes out, we'll keep monitoring it. Um, but I think we're okay for now uh, for the variants. But uh, the motto is definitely uh, vaccinate, 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 uh, and uh, uh, think positive and test negative for sure. Well said. Well said. We we agree. Um, I do have a quick question that was sent to me. Um, can you clarify that the 80% is not just vaccine uh, vaccines, but also factors previous infections and in whether or not they've been vaccinated? Yes. Uh, that reaching 80%, that timeline in our model includes both those who are vaccinated as well as those who are retaining immunity from previous infections. So uh, I, I think um, the most recent study out of a, a, a medical journal in the UK uh, showed that 99% uh, retain immunity for the first three months, and that doesn't drop very far. I think it drops to about 95% um, at about six months out and down to 87% at eight months out, if I'm remembering those numbers right. Um, so uh, retaining strong immunity from previous infections, yes, those are included in the forecast. 
Thank you. Thanks, Alex. We have another question that's been dropped in the in the chat from Lisa Morgan. Has there been any research on whether people have natural immunity to COVID-19? Uh, I've seen some, some hypotheses there. Uh, natural immunity, whether through things like blood type um, or other uh, genetic factors, we don't have those included in our model, but those are things that we will include uh, once, uh, once there's a, a strong publication or uh, uh, a strong reason to include that in the model. But uh, hopefully, hopefully there are some natural immunities there. Thank you. And another question, can you point to any areas of the economy that may have been overbought that may depress demand in the future? That may have been overbought? Yes. Not sure uh, that if that's uh, the intention there. Jeff, feel free to clarify if, if you're able. Yeah, so, so there was that, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So there was that graph that showed the recovery of various areas of the economy, you know, that, that may have suffered a loss of demand that, that they're going to make it yeah. back. What about other areas that might have experienced a lot of demand during the pandemic because of the pandemic? Would there be a counter cyclical there? That's what I'm trying to understand. Thank you. Sure, sure. So I think the, the biggest question um, that uh, companies uh, across the nation, across the world are facing are the, is the remote the remote work, the work from home question is how effective are we at that? Uh, how successful can industries be addressing that? And that is something that's going to have ripple effects um, throughout uh, commercial leasing, um, throughout uh, software and technological advances. Um, be uh, interesting to see uh, when people return to work, uh, uh, what happens to uh, the uh, Zoom stock, for example. Um, but uh, commercial leasing will definitely be a close factor to watch. Um, in terms of potential over overinflations or overbought that we won't re see return. Hmm. I, uh, one thing that we have concluded as a company is that remote work definitely won't decline. Um, it will continue at pre-COVID levels. Um, but there have been enough studies and enough polls um, that confirms that enough companies are going to do that, that the net will be an increase in remote work. Um, so the uh, hard to protect, predict exactly what's going to happen in the stock market, but in terms of employment, I think we'll see healthcare continue um, uh, to see a high demand there. Um, there's been an increase in um, like the, the price of wood and steel is through the roof right now because uh, of all of the uh, uh, home improvements that everyone's been doing at home since uh, vacation plans are shelved. Uh, many people are putting money into that. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting thing. Sorry, I, I'm waffling a bit, but it's definitely going to be interesting to follow um, to see exactly what's going to uh, what some serious long-lasting effects could be. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Jeff, for the question and, and for clarifying for us. Uh, Alex touched on this. I think this is a great time for us to transition and, and talk about the uh, returning to work uh, in person and uh, hybrid. There's a, there's a lot of discussion about uh, employ from employers and interest in bringing employees back uh, in a safe way. So thank you again, Alex. Really appreciate your time and expertise today. And now we are going to introduce introduce uh, Kendra Simmons from uh, Frederick Fredrickson and Byron. She's an attorney. Thank you so much, Kendra, for joining us. And please, again, feel free to leave questions for Kendra in, in the chat. But uh, please share with us uh, what uh, you are uh, seeing as best practices as it relates to returning to in-person work in the office. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Tiffany, and uh, to Alex and Jeff with a question for actually providing kind of the perfect segue into um, the the legal and I think HR side of returning to the office and 
uh, returning to work. Like Tiffany said, I'm Kendra Simmons. I'm a partner at Fredrickson and Byron where I focus on employment advice and litigation from a management or employer perspective. And really pleased to have the chance to speak with you all today over the past year. Uh, it has been a very interesting time to practice employment law. And uh, it is certainly um, a welcome change to be uh, looking forward at this point, and I think optimistically about what a return to the workplace looks like. So, um, Angie, if you don't mind flipping to the next slide, I'll preview the agenda here. Uh, we'll first get into uh, the future of the workplace and specifically um, the remote environment versus returning folks in person to the office. I agree with Alex that I think what we're going to see long term is a net gain in remote work. Um, and so we'll go over the rules um, and the uh, effects of that. We'll then get into uh, issues related to vaccination and the rules and trends surrounding that, uh, as well as inquiries that you can make to uh, your employees in returning to the workplace about their personal and family health. So with that, let's jump right into it and talk about the future of the workplace. So first, we have to take a look at what the rules are. And I have included links on these slides, and my understanding is that these can be made available to attendees after the webinar. Um, so I've included the links here because in the time that we have, it is really only possible to uh, scratch the surface. Um, but I will just highlight that the two, in my eyes, main authorities uh, that you should be aware of from an employment perspective as far as return to work guidance are the CDC and OSHA. And the CDC's guidance, of course, is what we've all been hearing about for a year plus now, right? Wash your hands, disinfect, wear face coverings, um, social distance, all those things uh, are still in place, even once we start returning folks to the workplace and even if they are vaccinated for at least some period of time we will have to maintain those same uh, safety measures and the image here on the right of the slide is the hierarchy of controls that you can access on the cdc's website and what you um, as employers really have the ability to do i think starts in the middle and it may be difficult to see but the hierarchy um, for, for us starts with the engineering control there in yellow. And so as employers, you should think about, um, you know, what can you do from an engineering perspective in your workplace as far as, you know, improving the ventilation systems, for instance, and the circulation of air in the workplace and what that can do to help uh, reduce exposure within the physical workspace. Then we jump to administrative controls. That is what um, is along the lines of, you know, alternating schedules, perhaps making sure that you don't have everybody in the work or the break room all at once, that type of thing. Um, and then kind of a, I, I don't mean to say last resort in a negative way, but um, PPE is there at the bottom of the hierarchy because that is really, you know, kind of if all else fails or as a backstop, we need to continue to uh, wear face coverings and uh, other PPE um, because that's really um, kind of the last uh, line of defense, essentially. Uh, and then, so that's the CDC, but then as it relates to OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, um, the, the thing to keep in mind here is uh, that all employers under OSHA have a general duty to provide a workplace that is free of hazards that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. That's the, the legal standard, but it is, I think, at a baseline what controls your obligations as employers to provide a safe workplace and um, meet that duty uh, with um, these type of controls that we've been talking about here. Uh, OSHA did release guidance at the end of January 2021. That's what uh, I've got a link to here on the slide. I'd encourage you to take a look at that when you have the chance because it goes through uh, a litany of suggestions that include having a return to work plan in place as employers, um, maintaining the, the type of safety controls that you know we've now been used to for 
a long time. And so um, you should explore that when you have the chance. I uh, wanted to mention quickly state guidance. Uh, in Iowa, quite frankly, there's very little unique state guidance. Uh, and I think there's a lot of deference to CDC, OSHA, and other federal agencies. Um, but a quick note that if you have operations in other states, Minnesota included, um, there, there may be other rules or guidance that apply. So be sure that you're aware of um, what, whatever your applicable state rules are. And one of the additional reasons to uh, be aware of what these rules are is that uh, there could be immunity from liability. If someone believes that uh, entering your uh, physical space caused them to contract COVID, as long as under Iowa law, you're following the applicable guidance, there is uh, some immunity uh, offered there, but that doesn't necessarily touch on employment immunity because there could be work comp issues, et cetera. Um, so at a high level, that is that are those are, excuse me, the rules that we're dealing with. And if you can flip to the next slide, Angie, um, this uh, then takes us to, okay, with th that guidance in mind, um, what what is the best plan for your workplace as far as remote versus in per, in person uh, operations? And the first uh, suggestion I would have, is that if your workplace is currently operating remotely in any respect, you should document how it's going. Measure productivity if there are problems, um, whether it be with productivity or performance or something else, document those. Because this will not only help you assess when and how to return to the physical workspace, but it will help you decide you know, going forward what your remote versus in-person operations look like, and it will help you uh, justify those decisions to your employees. And on that note, it's important to communicate to your employees what your plans are. If you plan to be remote for a while, that is fine if that's the decision that's best for you, but communicate uh, whatever your decision is to your employees. Because what we have seen happen, um, both in my own cases and in, um, I, I was just part of a conference last week where a representative from the EEOC was speaking and talking about how um, they've had more and more charges focused on a return to the workplace and when employees don't understand the decisions that are being made and why they are being made, they fill in the blank with something that's not good and not going to be favorable to you as the employer. So document, assess, and communicate your decisions to your employees. Uh, to the extent that you haven't already done so, um, be sure that you're protecting your confidential information, whether that be through policies telework agreements, um, v virtual private networks, VPNs, um, tracking software so that you know when information is downloaded from your system or um, uh, sent to a USB drive, or if employees are forwarding information to personal emails, that type of thing, you wanna make sure you have the ability to track all of that. Um, and then consider your employees' uh, reactions as well. Um, and we'll jump to the next slide here. Um, and <clears throat> I'll just say that, you know, employee reaction is one factor um, to consider in uh, making the decision about who and when to return to the workplace. But the first, and I think primary rule is consider um, to the extent that you are returning to in-person operations, who you are going to bring back. And by that, I mean, which position? which physicians need to be in the office, which make the most sense to have in the office, whether it's um, due to their function or their need for you know, certain internet access or other, I guess, administrative tools and controls. Um, that will, I think, in large part drive those decisions. Uh, and from there, uh, you know, consider uh, whether or how to open it up. Um, this conference I mentioned earlier uh, from last week, um, included a, a representative from Google who said that after kind of making certain decisions about who needed to be in the physical workspace going forward, they opened it up to their employees and like took surveys and really left it in large part to what employees wanted to do, which is uh, a little, uh, I don't want to say frightening necessarily, but I think more open-ended than I would probably uh, be comfortable with, but it is certainly uh, an option. 
Um, to the extent that you are uh, beginning the process of reopening, you can also consider reopening in phases or alternating schedules. That is one of those administrative controls I referenced earlier, and certainly a way um, to reduce exposure in the workplace and make sure that um, you know you don't have so many employees in the office at once that they don't have room to social distance and that kind of thing. As I mentioned earlier, you'll need to consider safety measures, uh, continue those, um, continue having employees, you know, wear masks and, and that kind of thing, social distance, all those safety measures. But then um, consider even if and when you return to the physical workspace, offering employees a remote option under certain circumstances. And this gets to Alex's point about, um, you know, the net gain in remote work uh, after the uh, pandemic ends or when we're on the other side of this. Um, their employees are really going to be looking for that kind of flexibility. Uh, and so to the extent that you are going to want to attract and retain the top talent, I think employees are really going to be looking for that kind of remote option when it suits them. And then also consider what other aspects of the remote environment you want to keep. You know, do you want to continue having certain meetings only be virtual, not in person? Um, do you want to maybe not offer uh, in-person lunch buffets during meetings, that kind of thing? I know I'm going to look at those things differently going forward myself. Um, so at a high level, those are the factors and the rules that you should be considering in making those decisions. And then we'll move on to talking about the vaccine and other health inquiries you can make. Um, the first rule here, or the first and primary question we've gotten is, can employers require the vaccine of their employees? The short answer is yes, as long as you make the right exceptions. And that would be for uh, disabilities or if employees have a sincerely held religious belief that would restrict them from getting the vaccine at a high level, those are the exceptions that you need to be making. Uh, and there's been some, I, I would call it academic debate about whether the FDA's um, emergency use, use authorization uh, changes the ability of employers uh, to require the vaccine uh, until there is that full authorization, which as I understand it should be coming um, uh, towards the end of the year, though that timeline is a little fuzzy. I have not seen anything to actually contradict that from a legal perspective. So as far as um, you know, I'm concerned, employers have the ability and the right to require the vaccine if they think that makes sense to them. And due to time, I'll go ahead and jump to uh, the next slide. Um, <clears throat> and the trends that we're seeing are primarily that a very few employers are going to actually require the vaccine, um, less than 10% by all indications. And I'll just candidly say that, you know, as far as the conclusion I've come to is that outside of the healthcare, and the long-term care industries and perhaps some others where employees are in really close contact with each other, um, requiring the vaccine is probably not going to be worth um, the hassle. Uh, and instead, you're probably better off just encouraging it and potentially offering some of the other incentives I have mentioned there. And then jumping to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, just because you, you can require the vaccine should you and what are the, some of the factors you should consider? Um, again, I think uh, most employers are going to be best off uh, uh, encouraging rather than requiring um, and potentially offering incentives. Um, some of the, the factors um, are, are some of what Alex mentioned uh, as well, as far as whether you should require versus encourage, um, you know, the rate of vaccination, um, the rate of variant spread. I think that'll affect the threat that COVID presents in the physical workplace. Um, and so those are things to keep a tab on as well as employee reactions and uh, feelings and just the, the setup of your workplace among uh, many other things. Um, if you choose to offer vaccinations on site, um, that could potentially trigger additional obligations for you. So I would, would generally suggest um, uh, encouraging employees to get it off-site and potentially offering some incentives if they do so. A lot of companies have announced plans to offer paid time off to employees who get the vaccine and other major companies like Kroger and Publix 
uh, have announced like a hundred dollar or one hundred twenty five dollar one time payments or gift cards. So those are potential options um, as well. Um, but whatever you decide, I recommend you know reserving the right to change your decision uh, later on. And then lastly, and and quickly here, um, the uh, other health inquiries that you can make of employees. Um, should be limited to only what you need to know as an employer, and you should always maintain the confidentiality of that separate information and maintain it separately. Um, you can't generally ask employees about, you know, their family members specifically, but what you can do, obviously, is screen employees, ask them the typical kind of symptom questions that I think we're all used to at this point, and focus your questions on their exposure and not necessarily um, you know, do your family members have COVID or have they have have they had COVID? Focus it on the symptoms and the employee uh, individually. And if we have time, I'm happy to take questions. But um, I know Stephen's got some valuable information as well. Thanks, Kendra. You covered a lot of ground in a in a short amount of time. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. We do have time for a couple of questions. If you do have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but, but Kendra, one of the things we've heard, um, some of the employers that have reached out to us, and certainly we are um, connecting them with experts like you, and we are not uh, necessarily the experts ourselves, so really appreciate your, your help and guidance. But for those that are um, employers that are encouraging return to in-person office work and team members who may say that they cannot come back to work for health reasons, what is or is not appropriate for employers to uh, discuss or vet, if you will, with, with that employee? Yeah, I think this is where, um, for me, job descriptions come in really key um, and keeping those updated. Um, I, for employers, would recommend that they focus those inquiries on um, the employer's essential job functions, uh, especially as illustrated in any job description and ask the employee about, um, you know, obviously express your, your sympathy or be empathetic, um, but explore what their concerns are and the impact that those concerns have on their ability to perform their job functions. And then obviously explore to the extent that that would, the concerns would prevent the employee from returning to the office um, if there's an actual disability there, then you have an obligation as an employer to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, but if you eventually discern that the concern is really just a, a general fear without a disability behind it, um, that's where it gets into really fuzzy territory, right? And you have difficult decisions to make. And hopefully that uh, addresses the question, but I could really go uh, for a while on that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and insight and, and guidance. Uh, again, if anyone else has questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat. And then Kendra, if you're available to hang on the line and respond to any questions that pop up, we would certainly appreciate it. Uh, we are going yeah, to... Thank you. We're, we're now going to transition over to our next and final speaker, which is Stephen Smith. Uh, from He's the head of people strategy at Work and People Analytics. Again, just please drop your questions in the chat. And Stephen, we will pass it over to you for uh, your insights. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, appreciate it. Not a slideshow, so you always have to listen to me talk. So I hope I can keep you engaged for the next 15. We talked about behavioral economic nudges, Kendra and Alex, which are both Awesome, I love hearing that kind of mentality. I think even Krispy Kreme just announced you get free donuts this year if you have a vaccination card, right? So we can all work together and do those little things. I think it goes a long way. Uh, quick background on me. I'm gonna come to you from two perspectives. Honestly, Kendra covered the first one, so that saves me uh, a lot of time. So thanks, Kendra. Um, I sit on the, our Central Iowa uh, board of SHRM. So I run people analytics there as well. And a lot of good things can also be found on our SHRM site. A lot of things that Kendra mentioned with OSHA, with EEOC, as well as some like the kind of tactical things, you know, what kind of policies, what are those cleaning procedures? What are the kind of communications? When should I roll those out? Who should be included? If you want to get any of that information, our, our SHRM site does a great job of covering that. Um, on, and, and again, people like Kendra are the experts that power that website. So thanks for that. 
Uh, my other hat is obviously WPA work in people analytics. So what we do is we really focus on the future of work and we've been doing this for years. And the two markets we've always served have now finally come together a little bit, uh, which is human resources and corporate real estate. So Alex, when you asked about corporate real estate and some of you know how that's gonna be influenced, hopefully we can start to shed some light with y'all on this. What we're seeing, um, and, and we work around the world, we work for municipalities across the, uh, across the nation, across the globe. We deal with uh, state agencies, we deal with federal agencies, we deal with upper education and everywhere in between. And what we're seeing across all of those partners and all of those you know, size of companies is that it's gonna be a bell curve, right? You're gonna have a certain portion of your population that is really focused on completely getting, doing away with uh, in-person office space, right? Salesforce, which is, uh, you know, in San Francisco, I was on that rooftop. I can only imagine how much that place costs. They've completely shed their space. Uh, on the other hand, you have people who are absolutely going back to workplace, right? You saw that Google just bought $7 billion worth of real estate in the last week. Um, so you're starting to see a huge flux of people who are going to one tail or the other with the large majority not acknowledging that there's gonna be some happy medium, right? There's going to be some hybrid work. Now, the question is, what does a hybrid work look like? And a lot of great things Kendra brought up um, in terms of who goes in and why and, and, and you know how many days in and off and what schedule and, and all of those things vary. And if anybody's telling you all out in the market they have the answer, they're lying to you because we don't know. We absolutely don't know. There aren't best practices yet. And you're seeing that, again, between some of the large partners who are going completely remote and some of those who are going completely in person. So what we can do is a few things um, to make sure that we are getting the best decision for us and our company. As Kendra mentioned, when we went home, we found a lot of things that potentially were bad habits in the workplace beforehand, right? Uh, Kendra, you mentioned some of those meetings that might not be as valuable once we went home. And, and we learned a lot of good things. We also learned a lot of pain points along the way. What I will say is for the organizations that believe that we have to come back to the office as soon as possible, it usually comes from a place of fear, maybe a little bit of love, but mostly fear. And the fear is usually, listen, I'm afraid that we're not working the same way. I'm afraid that our productivity is dropping. I'm afraid that we're going to lose our culture. I'm afraid that we're going to lose our collaboration. That makes us great. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid for all of these things. And at least if I see people in office, I know they're doing their job. That's an old, outdated model. Instead, we need to kind of follow the age-old adage where we need to measure what matters, and we can't really manage what we don't measure. So first and foremost, and again, Kendra, sorry to keep jumping on your train, but I thought you said had some great points. The first part's assessment. We need to have some metrics in place to understand, are we doing a good job this way? Are we keeping our culture? Are we losing it? Are we losing our people? Are we losing the collaboration that creates innovation in our companies? And if we don't measure that, we might go to one end of that pendulum swing uh, and lose a lot of good people because as she mentioned, uh, it is gonna become table stakes for people like me. Um, when you start to think about that talent, it's gonna, look a different way in the future. So we need to understand that. Knowing that we have such a wide scale of approaches so far, and we'll continue to see how they roll out. I think that something that's really important for us moving forward is thinking about implementing intelligent systems that can help us monitor throughout. What does that mean? Well, it's not a matter of the proverbial throwing something against the wall to see what sticks. It's a matter of making sure that we have the right systems that provide the right intelligence to continually assess and monitor and move. Listen, y'all, we've been talking about VUCA for the 20, last 20 years, and I think VUCA has a new meaning now, and that's gonna continue to increase. If it's not COVID, it will be something next. And if we're building our same strategy, the same way we always have and expecting a different results, Einstein says that makes you crazy or insane. And I know y'all aren't that. So if we want to change our mentality and how to approach this problem, it's really important to, again, create those systems that can really understand who, what, when, where, and why, um, so that we can align it to our purpose and our business goals. Probably the last thing I want to talk about at a high level um, is the idea of benchmarks. Because I just mentioned this huge, you know, kind of bell curve shape that we have, and 
right now it looks like Google's going to be on one end and Salesforce and, and our state, our, our federal governments might be on the other. Following benchmarks is going to be really dangerous right now because there is no average. I, we can get into a, a statistics conversation and Alex would love to have that, especially mentioning Nate Silver, but averages aren't going to work for us right now. So if we're trying to follow benchmarks, we're probably always going to fail because you aren't the 50th percentile. You're not the median in terms of who you are, what you do. Your organization is unique. It has different things that it needs to accomplish in different ways from your competitors down the street. So instead of trying to follow the benchmarks and instead of trying to find out the answer, which there is not, there isn't one yet, it's really important to know thyself, know who you are and what you do special. And once you understand your workforce and the opportunities that your workforce has to be successful in both place and in terms of policy, then we can start to create something that's going to propel your organization forward versus trying to copy the answers off the test from the guy down the street. Again, it's obviously a little bit biased because my background is in analytics. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist by background, but I do believe that it's really hard to manage what we don't measure. So if we want to understand who we are and what our unique opportunities are, it's going to first help to look into thyself. Again, I would highly encourage the organizations that are listening today. We often say that culture eats strategy for breakfast, but it doesn't seem that people measure that very often, but they'll still tell us that, man, we got to go back in office because we might lose our culture. What is your culture? Where is it going? Would this help it or hurt it? Those are the kind of things we have to consider. Now, we have some of the largest real estate partners uh, on earth uh, that we work with at WPA from architects to brokers to designers, uh, we even have Miss Kim on the, on the call today as well. And what they'll tell you is that, again, there's a, a unique opportunity to maybe not so much as shed space as to repurpose our space. The way the office and the workforce that worked in those offices a short 12, 24 months ago are going to look very different when we come back from this. And if we're trying to provide them the exact same layout, the exact same space in the exact same way, it's not going to work. Now. You know, when we do our assessments, again, uh, not flexing, but just want to give you some background context, we do these all over the world for organizations of all size. There's a few things that we're seeing. Number one, when we ask people about, you know, once the you know, proper precautions are taken inside the workplace, what is it that you care most to get back to? Um, I can tell you, and I think we give like 15 options. A private desk to work at is in the bottom three every single time. That is not a concern of our employees. And we have over 300,000 people have gone through this in the past two years. Private place to work is not even close to number one. What is close to number one? I miss that collaborative, spontaneous work. I miss that innovation. I miss that brainstorming. I miss the uh, resources and tools that I had at the office that I just don't have at home. Okay, that's a good place to start. Then we find out, well, what kind of work are you doing? You know, what are those behaviors? And Kendra mentioned job analysis or job description, and that's in terms of legality, huge, but also in terms of understanding who are our people, what are they doing, what behaviors and tasks do those break down to, and how are those best supported? You're going to often find out that there's a lot of tasks for certain types of people, of course. You got to throw in the individual, of course. But we find that there are tasks like corresponding, sending emails, analyzing spreadsheets. Dude, I can do that way better at home, save myself the commute time, keep on the PJs, and I can crank through way more emails at home than coming to the office and being distracted every five minutes. Vice versa, we see that there's behaviors like coaching, coordinating, planning, brainstorming. Those activities are very well supported in the office. So if we start to think about what does the new office or the policies of the future look like, it's going to be really important, and then even who comes back when and where, what are the internal networks? What is the work you're doing? How is it best supported? And then build on that. I think something that we have seen uh, you know, as we've gone through our assessments is that a lot of organizations, and when I say the word design, I mean both policy and, of course, space. Historically, we've always designed for humans. We've designed the space with the human in mind. And then we've kind of changed management it, it backwards. We reverse engineer to get people in there. Here's a space that we think people need based on what we, what we know about people. Uh, and now let's make sure that the right communications are there, the right change management, behavioral economics, all those things. Instead, the shift now needs to go to human-centered design. 
And although that sounds like a nuance, the difference between designing for humans and humans is that does it have better design is tremendous. And it has a huge impact on how we approach this problem, starting with human first, not design first. So again, that's probably a good summation uh, for my last 10 minutes of meandering to say, you need to know who you are. It's great to know what the legality says. That's important, of course. But benchmarks are going to become increasingly worthless. You're starting to see, again, that, that Google thing last week was huge. Know who you are, what your people do, what your culture is, what your business processes are, and how the workforce reinforces that, and then build some human-centered design off of that. And that's, I think, how we can see uh, our world kind of put the pieces back together in the right way. With that being said, I'm going to pull up the five minutes short just in case there's any uh, questions or dialogue. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate you sharing uh, your perspective uh, with, with everyone here. If anyone has a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, again, just would reinforce, I think, Alex, uh, your information that you shared off the, off the top of this call, really helpful in understanding that it, uh, it appears as though um, August would be the time frame that Iowa could expect to reach herd immunity, which is very, very exciting. Uh, there is continues to be great momentum and um, progress with vaccinations, which is also great news. And Kendra, really appreciate all of the insights you shared from an HR and legal perspective, considerations that, that employers need to make. Um, Stephen, thank you for your, for your time. And if any, anyone has a question, again, have uh, just a couple minutes here to, to do so. Um, Stephen, can you share, you had talked about how uh, you had been doing uh, research, I believe you said 300,000 uh, individuals that had been surveyed. Can you share, was that uh, recent data? And was it, could you share what you learned pre-COVID and what you've learned now that we are still uh, in COVID recovery mode? Yeah, absolutely. So we've probably done about 300,000 in the past two years. During COVID, that probably number is probably honestly half of that. So probably 150,000 individual responses across the world in the past year. Uh, and by the way, a lot of that's local uh, here in Des Moines. And I think some of those things that we found that were kind of ahas, and I think are kind of intuitive now that I say them out loud, but yeah, we learned that there was a lot of bad habits we built up in the workplace in traditional way. And honestly, we replaced that with a lot of efficiencies and became actually arguably much more effective if we know how to measure productivity, culture, leadership satisfaction, ability to stay, connection to the organization, uh, discretionary efforts. So I think what Kendra said was, you know, essentially don't throw the baby out with bathwater here. And that's absolutely the case. We found a lot of ways to improve our workforces by thinking of working a new way. Obviously, that's going to have an impact in space. The second one was, and I apologize for repeating myself a little bit, people aren't missing private offices like we think they do. We think everybody's going to want to come back and be super safe and want to have uh, individual one-on-one -on -one private offices for everybody. And that is just not flat out not the case. That's one of the last things people say. I want to come to a space that engages me. I want to come to a space that excites me uh, and I'm able to connect and build some of that collaborative, innovative thinking with. Okay, that's great. So if we think about building or repurposing our space in the future, don't go back to the same you know, 1950 design of, of rows of desks and cubicles one-on-one -on -one that isn't gonna work, y'all. Instead, build an environment that makes me as an employee want to come to the campus, not force me to come to the campus. I think I just heard somebody talking about, oh, Alex, maybe when I heard you talking about kind of the behavioral economic nudge, the second you tell me I have to, uh, maybe it's just me being a, the kind of guy I am, but I don't want to. Um, but if you create a space that makes your talent want to come for the right reasons and to do the right things that move the organization forward in terms of, again, collaboration, innovation, some of that coaching and communication, that is the space that's going to make our business successful versus uh, repeating the same mistakes as yesteryear. Thanks. Thanks again. Really appreciate uh, the insights uh, and information, Alex, Kendra, Stephen, that you have all shared today. Thank you to all who could join us for this uh, information-packed call uh, today. It's been very, very helpful. It's great information as we continue to move forward toward a pandemic recovery. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, again, we have our regular 
regularly scheduled investor and member briefing uh, tomorrow at noon, virtual, of course, at this point. And we will be joined by Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, we'll also be receiving an update from uh, David Stark with Unity Point Health Des Moines. So really excited to have him back. It will be another insightful conversation. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to the speakers for dropping their information into the chat. So if you have questions, you can follow up with them or, of course, follow up with us at the partnership directly. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.